Now, March is National Nutrition Month, and we wanted to take some time to discuss the importance of eating healthy. So Chelsea Chandler, a wellness dietitian with UNF, spoke with me about disordered eating and how we can reduce the risk. Unfortunately, there's not a clinical definition for what that means, but it is a term that practitioners will use to describe really a wide range of unsupportive eating habits, exercise habits, and really they're often quite similar to or even the same as what we see in an eating disorder, but maybe someone's not meeting the exact criteria to be diagnosed with an eating disorder. So in fewer words, this is kind of the gray area and mm -hmm. To me, this is often a phase or a step on the path towards developing a full-scale eating disorder. And what are the signs, boy, that we need to be on the outlook for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there can be so many, but some that we see a lot are frequent dieting, maybe chronic weight fluctuations. Maybe someone's exhibiting a lot of anxiety around certain foods or entire food groups. Um, oftentimes, we find people feel a lot of guilt and shame around their food choices or they've developed a very rigid structured routine around food and exercise. And when there's interruptions to that, there's a lot of anxiety and stress. So any type of preoccupation with food movement and body that's disrupting the quality of life. And Chelsea, I get some anxiety just walking down the grocery store out. Now I can't tell. I mean, we got low fat here, sugar free. I've got all these images, but oh my gosh, what choice should I make? So uh, what may put someone at risk for developing this disordered eating and who's likely to be at risk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first and foremost, really anyone can be at risk. And, you know, we, we often see this depiction of a thinner white adolescent female, but you know what, that is a group that is affected, but it's not the only group that's affected. Um, so one main risk factor that we see is dieting. And a lot of people think that that's extreme dieting, but it can be pretty moderate, casual dieting that a lot of people receive some praise for doing. Um, actually 35% of dieters are found to go on to develop disordered eating. And that's a study from the late nineties back when eating disorder prevalence was around 3% and it's actually tripled. So in 2022, if they decide to replicate that study, I can only imagine what the numbers would be. So oh dieting gosh. itself is a risk. Yeah. Um, the next one I think is no surprise to most people, social media use. And in the last couple of years, I think we've all been on our screens more during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So what we see is a lot of comparison syndrome to oftentimes things that aren't even really real, um, but also the algorithms kind of can be dangerous in, the, in itself because you might search for a healthy eating recipe and next thing you know, you're on some pretty, you know, damaging information. Um, so that is definitely something to look out for. However, one of the most well-known environmental uh, contributing factors uh -huh. is our societal idealization of thinness. And this comes from beauty standards, but also in health and kind of this notion that thin equals healthy automatically, which is also not necessarily true. Just seems like these phones, all the things you're seeing, we're just like inundated, almost overwhelmed with all of this. So you got to have this perfect image. You got to eat these perfect foods. So how do we get away from that, Chelsea? Yeah, so it's a large scale issue that requires a large scale change. However, there are absolutely some tips and tricks that I have for you today that can, you know, you can use these in the home with your kids and schools or even just in conversations with friends, family, loved one um, that seems small but can have ultimately a big impact. So first and foremost, shifting and expanding the language we use around our food. So instead of just good or healthy, bad or unhealthy, you know, using descriptive words like crunchy, sweet, satisfying, mm -hmm. maybe nostalgic, like grandma's cookies. Yeah. Um, and that really neutralizes the experience. So we don't have that big emotional response to I ate a bad food, then I must be bad, right? right. Um, number two, practicing uncoupling your food and movement choices from aesthetic goals and start thinking about how you physically feel with these things. So something I ask people all the time, would you do this exercise if there was no chance that it would have any um, change on the way your body looked? And mm -hmm. most people are like, I would never ever run again. Are you kidding me? I would not <laughs> do that. So it's like, okay, great. You don't have to run. You can dance, you can roller skate. There's a uh -huh. million things that you can do that might make you feel physically and emotionally better rather than you know seeing movement uh, or food as like a punishment or a means to an end. Um, number three, normalizing body diversity. 
So here in Florida, we have all different types of palm trees, right? right? And we don't look at one and wish that it looked like a different one. And we don't look at one and say, gosh, there must be something horribly wrong with that one mm -hmm. because it doesn't look like this other one. We just appreciate them for what they are and we move on with our day. Yeah, we're special um, in our own ways, even palm trees. I like it. That's a great example. Exactly. <laughs> um, so number four, avoid commenting on people's bodies. And even if you think you're giving them a compliment, um, because a lot of times when you say something like, hey, you look great, you have you lost weight? What people really hear is, oh my goodness, I have to look this way oh. to receive attention and praise and, and love maybe even. So uh, we also don't know what we're commenting on. You know, it's possible that person just had COVID for two weeks and hasn't had a good meal. Right. Um, yeah. It's possible that maybe, yeah, maybe they've been super stressed out with, um, you know, mental health struggles, or maybe they are actually experiencing disordered eating and then they're getting praise for it. Um, uh, last but not least, and this is a tough one for people, but deleting those calorie tracking apps and even getting rid of the scale, because those things kind of tend to make us want to focus on things outside of our body mm -hmm. rather than listening to the cues that our bodies are telling us. Um, so if that's a hard one to do. I definitely recommend reaching out to a professional to help you through that. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on our show, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Okay, and of course, uh, where can folks go for more information on this? So there's uh, several websites. Uh, Intuitiveeating.org can be helpful. Help at Every Size website, which I believe is ASDA, A S D A H dot org. And then also uh, NIDA, which is the National Eating Disorder Association. They have some great information if you're worried about someone or, or for yourself as well. All right. Thank you once again. And of course, you can check out our website, and that is firstcoastliving.net.